and download the program and follow along. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Anil Shrestha, the current chair of the Department of Viticulture and Enology. And on behalf of Fresno State's Viticulture and Enology program, I am pleased to welcome everyone to our first Grape Day webinar. We have planned a great program for you this morning and have incorporated presentations and videos that will showcase some of the talent and unique facilities of our program. For those of you who may not know, Grape Day was uh, historically held in the Fresno State campus uh, with the new situation, with our new virtual format. However, we are able to still reach to you, um, this time actually over the state and even the globe. So thank you all for joining us from your home or office, wherever you may be this morning. I am proud to provide leadership to our academic program faculty, staff, and students while serving the needs of the grape and wine industry. Now, as many of you know, we offer undergraduate and graduate degree programs for our students and are well known for our rigorous coursework and hands-on training opportunities. Unfortunately, the current situation hasn't allowed us for hands-on training opportunities, but we are offering some classes that will offer hands-on training opportunities even in this fall. Our research center, also has a history of helping solve issues facing our industry through service projects and competitive research grants. And students have taken advantage of the opportunity uh, to enhance their academic careers by getting involved with research projects under the direction of our faculty scientists. And today you'll get to meet some of our faculty and graduate students um, uh, who will be talking about their research and it's a great pleasure to have young people in our faculty and young graduate students who are very enthusiastic in the program, as you will see and when you listen to them. As we begin our time together, I first want to thank the American Vineyard Magazine for their continued support of Fresno State's Viticulture and Enology program. And we are proud to acknowledge them or pleased to acknowledge them as a 2020 Grape Day industry sponsor. I would also like to extend my thanks to presenters who will be sharing their experience and expertise in several research projects. And for more information of our, about our presenters, uh, their bios, abstracts, and schedule, you can visit our website. And we've also provided a link for that. I also want to make sure that many Fresno State Viticulture and Algae faculty, staff, and students who have helped with this webinar behind the scenes uh, Cynthia, Andrea, including members of University Technology Services and Fresno State Alumni Association. Your teamwork and assistance is much appreciated. It looks like it's easy to present a webinar, but believe me, behind the scenes, a lot is involved in getting this thing together. So thank you all for the support, uh, faculty and staff. And today's Master of Ceremonies will be Dr. Stephen Summer. Uh, he's the director of the Viticulture and Enology Research Center. And before we begin the presentations, I would like to introduce a special guest, our Dean of the Jordan College of Agriculture, Science and Technology, Dr. Dennis Neff. And some of you may know Dr. Ne Dennis Neff, um, some of you may not. Um, Dr. Dennis Neff uh, is not new to our university. In 2019, after 35 years of service to Fresno State, Dr. Neff joined uh, Jordan, actually returned to the Jordan College of Ag as Dean. His previous positions included Department Chair of Ag Economics, Associate Dean and Acting Dean of the Jordan College of Ag, 
and several leadership positions such as Associate Vice Pro Provost and Associate Vice President of the University. We very much appreciate Dr. Neff's leadership um, with our college and university, and we are pleased that he could be with us this morning. So with that, I would turn it over to Dr. Neff. Well, thank you, Dr. Shreth. That was a very kind introduction. Um, as many of you know, agriculture has been identified as an essential industry and in this COVID-19 environment, we're certainly grateful for all those who are actively involved. Our faculty at the Viticulture Enology Department and our researchers at the Viticulture Enology Research Center, our students continue to work tirelessly on trying to find ways to improve the productivity and solve some of the problems facing the industry. And we're grateful for a university that allows them to continue to do that at this, in this rather trying time. Um, I want to thank them personally and express my appreciation for their willingness to share what they're finding out as they are involved in looking for solutions. I'd also like to express my appreciation to Dr. Stress and Andrea from the department, uh, Dr. Summer and Cynthia Wood from the Viticulture and Knowledge Research Center, and the other members of the organizing team that have put this together. I think that it'll be not only an educational event today, but I hope you find it enjoyable. Thank you for participating. And now I'll pass the microphone and the spotlight to Dr. Stefan Summer, who's, as previously noted, will be our MC. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Neff. Thank you um, for, for participating in, in this event, and thanks everybody for, uh, for joining in. Um, I'm the director of the, the Viticulture and Energy Research Center, and I will be your master of ceremonies today. Uh, so just a few housekeeping items uh, from me. There will be a break in the program at around 10 o'clock. Um, the whole program will uh, conclude at 11.30. Um, you will have que uh, question and answer sessions in between um, after each talk and uh, one longer uh, question and answer session uh, at the end. If you have not done so already, you can download the program, you can follow along. Um, with the abstracts, the titles, and the or the presenter info. If you have questions um, during a talk, please use the Q and A section um, that you find in your uh, in your menu. Um, the chat is uh, not um, the part for for question and answers. We will not um, answer questions that are typed in in the chat. Um, but the Q and A section will be answered live after each presentation. And our presenters will also type answers. Um, so you can keep asking questions in that, in that category and we will try to get to every, every question in there. Um, for the best viewing experience during that webinar, please use um, the speaker view. Uh, so you will be able to always see the person who's, who is talking. Uh, we will use a spotlight function in, uh, in Zoom to make that a little easier for you but the speaker view um, will give you um, the best viewing experience. Um, in order to introduce um, what Versi, the Viticulture and Energy Research Center is doing, um, we usually do little tours uh, during Grape Day, but um, because this is a virtual event, um, it's obviously not an option, uh, but we have a little video for you um, that I would like to share so you can get to know um, what Versi is and uh, what we're doing around here. It's just a two minute video to, to introduce you um, to, to the center. And I wish it would work. See, we have our first technical problem here. Okay, we have to put in that video, let me see. Sorry about that. That is the power of technology. Okay, 
Sorry about that. The video does not work. Um, we will we will uh, watch that video um, in a little bit. Um, I will try to make the technology work while we um, we're going to um, the first talk, um, and we start the program today um, with our um, viticulture professor, Dr. Luca Brillante, and um, one of his graduate students. Um, Dr. Brillante is uh, talking about. Um, vineyard soil reclamation and doses of calcium sulfate um, in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, his graduate student is actively uh, working in the field uh, on this, um, this project. Uh, Dr. Pilante came to Fresno State in, in 2018 and he's currently holding the position of the Bronco Wine Company uh, Viticulture Chair. He's an assistant professor in viticulture uh, with a PhD in soil science from um, the University uh, of Bourgogne in France. Uh, prior to coming to Fresno State, uh, he was a postdoctoral researcher for the Department of Viticulture and Enology at UC Davis, um, working on precision viticulture and uh, the implementation of variable rate and site-specific management approaches. At Fresno State, he's focusing on wine grape production, vineyard management, and he's engaged in uh, courses in general viticulture, mechanized viticulture, advanced grape and vine enterprise management. His master student, Kushwinter Singh, is a uh, current master student in the, in the program. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in general agriculture from Casa College in India um, and moved to, uh, to the US in 2018 to pursue his master's degree. Um, he's working with Dr. Brillante on, on the project of uh, physical responses of grape wine to salt stress and the reclamation uh, by use of different uh, forms and doses of gypsum. So I will turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Brillante now and, and his master's student for his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sommer, for introducing us and thank you everybody for attending uh, the great day. Uh, it's the I see a very large number and I congratulate Cynthia Wood for the huge work on this webinar. Um, uh, our talk will just introduce you uh, um, to our current research on uh, methods on soil reclamation with uh, calcium sulfate in uh, the San Joaquin Valley, a project that we currently have ongoing and has been founded by the American Linear Foundation. So we will talk about problems of salinity in California and then uh, different problems related to salt accumulation in soils. Uh, what uh, salt buildup means and what, can, uh, what effects can be observed on the grapevine. And then we will focus on the topic of this project, which is the reclamation by soil amendments. So, Salinity, especially in the western side of the San Joaquin Valley, is a, a huge problem and has been estimated uh, by a group in uh, Riverside that uh, uh, almost 8 million acres are salt affected. And of these, 45% uh, of the surface area in the, western side, uh, on, in the western side of the San Joaquin Valley is actually affected. Of this 45%, 30% is actually severely affected and so create problems with crop production. Salt affected soils can be differentiated in multiple types. We have traditional agricultural soils where we do not have problem in electrical conductivity because the amount of salts and general ions inside the soil water increase the conductivity of the, of the soil. Uh, that's because the ions can actually Con conduct current uh, more than the pure water itself. And then we have saline soils, we have sodic uh, soils, and we have saline sodic soils. Of these, the sodic soils are the ones which are the poorest structure and are characterized by having an high sodium absorption ratio, SAR, and a low electrical conductivity. The problem related to the sodium accumulation inside soils is um, due to the fact that sodium has a very strong affinity for the clay surface that are the 
places inside the soils where all the nutrients accumulate and can be uh, accessed by the plants. In this case, they are replaced by sodium, and uh, the sodium has the tendency of dispersed clays, and dispersion means that they do not aggregate, they no longer form clods, and so we have a poor structure and the formation of surface crusts. We have an increase in uh, bulk density, which means we have an increase in the compaction and the reduction in soil aeration. And this affects also the hydraulic properties of the soil, and specifically we have a, a reduction in hydraulic conductivity, that means lower infiltration rates, creating water ponding that in turn can also affect uh, oxygen uh, access uh, to the roots and uh, definitely have problems in, uh, on the plants, create problems on the plants. You can see that independently on this plot, uh, you can see that independently from the um, from the uh, sal salinity of applied water, uh, you can have severe reduction of infiltration. And actually, if there is a strong difference between the salinity of the water and the salinity of the soil, you tend to be uh, uh, to have problems in infiltration, even at low uh, sodium absorption ratio. So those are pictures of crust at the soil surface uh, in a sodic soil in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, images of uh, problems with infiltration that you may have been familiar with. They are uh, very well uh, observed uh, across the full valley, but of course this is a loss of water because the water uh, in the ponds tends to evaporate before infiltrating, thus creating eventually uh, a reduction in efficiency uh, for the irrigation. And so the effects on the gray vines can be differentiated in two phases. We have a rapid response to the osmotic shock, uh, so excess of salts creating distress uh, which is an osmotic stress. And then we have uh, a slower toxicity that can in the end create even major problems, which is related to consecutive accumulation during the season and then year after year related to accumulation of salts inside uh, the tissues. So initially the effects are very similar to the effects of the drought stress. Uh, for instance, we have cell dehydration uh, and a decrease in transpiration rate, uh, which in turn affect the growth. So we have reduction in growth. And then uh, long-term problems or stronger problems can be related to leaf burns uh, because of ions accumulation and then reduced yield and um, the, uh, which is a consequence of reduced growth. So you can see in these pictures how the uh, leaf sunburns uh, also happens in new planting. This is a French columbar block. Otherwise you can have effect in uh, uh, producing vineyards as well. So traditionally in the San Joaquin Valley, these problems have been solved by using uh, calcium sulfate, which is commonly referred to as gypsum inside on the soil. And uh, the reason is that the sodium on the exchange uh, positions on clays can be actually replaced by calcium, which has a stronger affinity than sodium uh, for the clays. The, the nice thing about calcium respect to sodium is that uh, it can aggregate the clays, thus reducing dispersion, uh, and so having a, uh, the opposite effect that the sodium has. And so for this reason, it's very well um, used as an amendment in uh, our uh, conditions of the San Joaquin Valley. And it's common practice to bring one tons per acre per year uh, without much calculation on uh, uh, the reasons and uh, the actual amount that should be needed. And one of the questions that we posed uh, was if instead of just using one tons per acre, we increase a larger dose, can we actually accelerate uh, soil reclamation? Another uh, question that we had in this uh, um, project was that we have different forms uh, of calcium sulfate that can be available on the market. And uh, 
we have calcium sulfate dehydrate, which is the uh, gypsum, and then we have calcium sulfate anhydrate, which is uh, calcium sulfate without uh, water molecule in the crystalline structure inside uh, the, uh, the, the, the molecule of calcium sulfate itself. And so commonly for simplicity across the agricultural world, uh, they are commonly referred as gypsum, but they have some difference as we see inside the structure. And it has been reported in this article in 2014 that was published in, on, in Nature that the crystallization water of gypsum rocks can be a relevant water source for plants, especially in dry conditions. And so could that make it, so this was observed in natural areas, could we uh, have an effect which is similar to this also in uh, horticulture fields? So the project was founded in 2019 by the AVF and the estimated duration is three years. So we are currently in the second growing season for this project. In the summer 2019, we located the vineyard and performed the baseline measurement of vineyard and soil conditions in order to uh, assess that no difference were uh, present uh, before applying the treatment in order to, um, to clarify and remove noise from the treatment application, the treatment effects. So the soil is a sodic soil in uh, uh, the sun, uh, in the southern side, uh, south of Bakersfield, uh, of the southwest of Bakersfield in the San Joaquin Valley. It's a Merlot vineyard planted on 1103P and is a California sprawl at uh, eight by 11 feet. So we just take a portion of this huge block uh, and each uh, treatment has been applied on squares, square plot, uh, which are 30 meter by 30 meter or 100 feet by 100 feet and located on a grid. The reason why we use this uh, experimental design was because each single plot by size and location correspond to, uh, uh, directly corresponds to a pixel of Landsat 8 satellite. So we can actually monitor uh, the progress of the vegetation, not only by traditional means, but also using remote sensing. Uh, this vineyard had huge problems in infiltrations uh, measured by double ring infiltrometers. Uh, we have seen that in general across all treatments, we had a decrease in infiltration velocity by uh, saturating the soils and finally in, in saturated conditions, uh, the infiltration velocity was uh, lower than the emission rate from the drippers, thus creating water ponding at the surface. And those are some images of actually measuring this uh, um, infiltration velocity in the field. The, as I said, in 2019, in the summer, we had not applied the treatment yet, so we didn't expect any difference. And in fact, uh, the stem water potentials measured at midday didn't uh, uh, differentiate uh, the experimental units uh, between themselves as well as uh, uh, aggregation of the water status condition all over the growing season, which is the carbon isotope discrimination of grape sugars. And then no difference were also observed in uh, uh, grape composition. One of the parameters we are most interest, interested in is as the grape vine is very sensitive to uh, uh, salinity uh, concerning yield reduction, uh, we didn't observe a difference in yield across or in berry weight across the uh, experimental units. So uh, these were the data in 2019. And then Kushwinder uh, uh, is a graduate student in the lab that was hired in January 2020 to continue this work and apply the treatment. And has been doing a very uh, good job so far. And we'll introduce you uh, in, in uh, the data of this year. We have a total of six treatments of calcium sulfate in our experiment, replicating four, time, four times. First is control with no application of calcium sulfate, then is 50%, 100%, 200% gypsum, that is 2.5 tons, 5.1 and 10.2 tons per acre. We also have 100% anhydrite and 100% gypsum plus two tons per acre of biosolid compost. We have broadcasted our soil amendments in the bands under the vines using the commercial tools in our, our experiment of 24 acres. We have examined the water status 
every 15 days with the help of stem water potential using the pressure chamber and we have observed no no significant differences in in between the treatments and but severe to uh, moderate water stress has been observed in the wines we have also examined the photosynthesis and transpiration at four different dates using the infrared gas analyzer but but no significant differences has been observed in uh, uh, carbon assimilation neither in the stomatal conductance and nor in intrinsic water use efficiency so far we have done two berry samplings in last 15 days total uh, soluble solids is close to 20 bricks and uh, no significant differences has been seen in the ph and the total soluble solids we have done the infiltration measurements uh, at the horizon using the single ring uh, infiltration method. The treatments start to separate, but no significant differences has been seen in the infiltration. We have followed the uh, we have followed the reflectance of the canopies using a vegetative index from la uh, satellite Landsat 8. Normalized difference vegetation index uh, decreases. Uh, uh, nor normalized difference vegetation index decreases as the canopy grows all older across all the treatments. Uh, for all the treatments, crop response to salinity index uh, decreases during the pre-verizon stage, which is also recorded as the period of water stress. We plan to complete the uh, berry ripening curves in the harvesting season of 2020, also including the measurement of uh, grape phenolics using the HPLC. We will continue the measurements of metals in petioles and blades from the samples that we collected at the bloom stage. We will continue the routine measurements of soil physical and chemical properties and also the remote sensing of past and present conditions. We had applied the amendments at the end of the winter season. The soil takes some time to react and show its effect on on the plants. Uh, so we will continue to monitor the wines and inform you guys i would greatly thank uh, i'm very grateful for the health and uh, leaf sampling and doing the field measurements for, for my colleagues uh, while the manjaris uh, chihai faith paulo and uh, matthew for helping me i'm very thankful to dr sun and ARA AR, for their help i'm grateful to med convenient foundation for funding my position and this project I would also like to extend my thanks to Bronco Wine Company for uh, for their logistics support and access to the vineyard. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Luca and Kuswinda. Um, very fascinating presentation. Um, looks like we don't have any questions so far. Uh, so just a reminder for everyone: please type your questions into the Q and A section. Um, at the bottom, um, Luca and Kushwinda will be available to answer those questions uh, throughout the day. So if you um, if you come up with questions, please uh, type them in. They will they will answer either um, with a written response or they will answer the question um, in person at the end of of the event. Um, we still don't have any questions. So thank you, thank you very much, you very for, much. Your, for your presentation. Um, I will try to uh, play that video again. Um, so the, the video that we skipped in the beginning. Okay. Fresno State's Viticulture and Enology Research Center connects students, faculty, and staff to meet the ever-changing needs of California's renowned grape and wine industry. Researchers enjoy a wealth of on-site resources that include a 120-acre vineyard, the nation's first and largest campus winery, laboratories, classrooms, and the Jordan Agricultural Research Center. A new greenhouse being planned as well as a renovated research and teaching winery that would strengthen student education and applied training. 
The campus location offers ideal proximity to national leading areas for raisin and table grapes in the Central Valley and wine grapes in Central and Northern California. Projects can easily access a wide variety of fruit, vineyards and growing conditions with direct input from professional partners. Faculty are enhancing the center's national reputation with presentations at conferences, articles in scientific journals and trade publications. The research center also hosts outreach events that showcase the latest vineyard and winery management methods and equipment. Industry support and commodity boards are currently driving most of the research, often matched by grants from government organizations such as the Agricultural Research Institute. The research program's wide array of projects reflect the legacy of Dr. Vincent E. Petrucci, who oversaw the Viticulture and Enology program for 46 years. He officially opened the research center in 1985, yet the centers and departments roots to innovation, teaching, and industry coordination date back to his arrival on campus in 1948. Faculty and staff take pride in training students to develop hands-on skills to lead many of California's most prized agricultural industries in new directions. Um, so this was just a, a brief introduction of what we're doing. We will show you um, a few more videos along the way just to replace the personal tours that we're usually giving during that event. Um, I think we um, have a poll for you now. Um, we have a few, a few questions that we would like to, um, to get out to the, to the audience just to find out um, if that event is any different from the, the in-person event. So please uh, take a few seconds to, to answer that question so we find out um, who you are and, uh, and where you come from. Um, and we will use that data to make uh, our content a little bit more accessible to, to our audience in the future. Because we're all learning from these virtual events and we're trying to, to be there for you. Okay, we're 50% there. A few more seconds, still have time to answer. Okay, that's probably good enough. Thank you very much for, um, for answering. Um, I want to share those results. So it looks like we, we have a majority of, um, of growers and vineyard managers uh, around here. Um, that's very, very interesting, very interesting data for us. Um, so we can adjust the content for, um, for future events. Thank you very much for, for participating. There will be more polls along the way. Um, we will have more questions for you. Okay, our next uh, speaker is our, uh, our guest speaker from um, the USDA. Um, it's uh, Dr. Rachel Nagele. Uh, she is a table grape and raisin expert uh, working for, uh, for the USDA um, in the area. Uh, she's been with the USDA since 2015 and um, she joined uh, the, uh, the USDA as a research horticulturist for table and raising grapes um, with an emphasis on uh, abiotic and biotic stress resistant uh, in, in grapes. Her research is uh, mostly on the genetic side, but she's addressing real world problems in pest management and, and breeding uh, problems. Her love for plant breeding and pathology developed at Michigan State University where she received her master's and her PhD degree. Um, today, Dr. Negler will be discussing some important table grape updates um, with a focus on breeding novelty and resistant grapes. Welcome, Dr. Negler. Thank you. 
So as Stefan said, my name is Rachel Nagley. If you haven't met me before, I'm with the USDA ARS. And um, I'm actually, this isn't really so much a research talk as more of a breeding update talk to show you some of the different things that we're working on. If you have any questions about any of the other projects that I allude to but don't really talk about, feel free to email me later or ask questions. I'm always happy to, to talk to people. Um, if you haven't been to our station before, it's the San Joaquin Valley Agricultural Sciences Center located down in Parlier. It's right across from the Kearney Agricultural Sciences Center pretty much. We have two breeders on site. We have Dr. Craig Ledbetter who's in charge of cultivar development, which basically just means that he's in charge of selections, evaluations, and crosses for the commercial cultivar development side. And then in 2015, I was brought on for the pre-breeding. And the best way to think about the pre-breeding is that this is looking at resistance and more fruit quality breeding. So when I say pre-breeding, um, not everyone knows exactly what that means. And you have to think about breeding as a pipeline and a process. It can take anywhere from 20 to 30 years to develop a new grape cultivar, depending on what you're working with. A pre-breeder just focuses on the early parts of the breeding phase. So that might be um, trait identification. It might be trying to get those traits into something that is more cultivated. So a lot of the stuff we work with is very wild and weedy. Um, they have poor fruit traits, whether it's wine grape or table grapes you're talking about. And so trying to get those traits that we care about, whether it's disease resistance or insect resistance into something that's more favorable um, is really useful. We also spend a lot of time working on tool development. So I told you breeding takes a very long time. So trying to develop tools to be able to better evaluate vines or to be able to select vines with the traits you want at an earlier phase. And this also allows us to work on more high risk traits, um, which is something insect resistance falls into that category often. And the best way to think about this is that the focus is on management strategies not just breeding, which is a very long-term management strategy, but also short-term strategies. Now, something my lab works on a lot is actually plant pathology. Um, I realize that for most people, as a breeder, you don't think that that's something we would work with, but we actually do. Um, the two pathogens that I work with primarily are botrytis, which causes gray mold and bunch rot, and powdery mildew pathogen, Ericepe indicator. Now, for both of these, I do a little bit of work on fungicide resistance. So for botrytis, if you've gone to any of uh, Dr. Chunglin Zhao's talks, where he's talked about frequency of fungicide resistance to different and increases over time, that's work that we do in collaboration with each other. I also work on the powdery mildew side with Brain Networks, which if you aren't familiar with, is an SDRI cap grant led by Washington State University and Michelle Moyer, trying to develop strategies for um, reducing fungicide resistance development in powdery mildew. And from my part, we mostly focus on how fungicide resistance develops within a growing season, um, across years, how different spray programs can increase or decrease your risk of fungicide resistance development. And for the powdery mildew, we also have a small project that we're doing with Gabriel Torres um, down in, uh, we have two field sites in the Central Valley. But again, these are more of a, a short-term management strategy. Ideally, what we wanna focus on is a long-term, which is where the breeding comes into play. So our breeding program really has two pieces. We have resistance breeding, and then we have fruit quality. From the resistance breeding side, these are things like um, disease resistance. So that's gonna be bacteria, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. Fungi, like the powdery mildew and the bunch rot resistance that we're working with. You might have seen me give talks before about mealybug resistance. My lab has been spending a lot of time trying to develop resistance in grape to vine mealybug. But then we also have abiotic or environmental stresses that we work on as well. So chilling isn't something that you would typically think about for the Central Valley, but having grapes that don't require chilling or don't require any sort of dormancy can be more useful in the southern parts of the state like Coachella. So we, we do work on the abiotic side as well. We do a little bit of work with nutrient accumulation and usage. We just submitted a paper a couple few weeks ago about um, sodium uptake in grapes and magnesium. So we, we kind of do a whole spectrum. 
just to give you an example of what that kind of looks like. So this is some of the work we've been doing with Xylella fastidiosa and host resistance. So Xylella is the causal agent of Pierce's disease in California. So it's a bacteria. It's an insect transmitted bacteria and it's primarily transmitted by leaf hoppers or like the glassy wing sharpshooter, which is pictured up here. The insect vector and the bacteria are distributed throughout a great portion of California, which you can see in the counties marked in blue on this map. That doesn't mean that it's a problem in all of those areas. It just means that it's been reported. Pierce's disease in California tends to be a very regional specific issue. There is a lot of resistance breeding going on. Andy Walker's group has released a few cultivars, wine grape cultivars. David Ramming was working on table grape cultivars before he retired and Craig Ledbetter has continued that work. And, but one of the things when you're thinking about resistance breeding is that you want to breed durable resistance. Like I said earlier, it takes a long time to breed it. And so when you develop a resistant cultivar, you want it to be resistant for 15, 20, 30 years, ideally forever. Um, you don't want something that's only gonna be resistant for five years or 10 years once you put it out into the world. And a lot of that, and the dur durability of resistance, a lot of that is dependent on the genetic diversity of your pathogen. So for Xylella, historically people have said that there is low genetic diversity meaning there's not a lot of variability among individual bacteriums. But one of the first things I did when I got to the USDA was I tested this because I don't always like to take things at face value. So in the left-hand column, we have isolate or strain. Those are just individual xylella bacteriums, genetic individuals that we evaluated. In the right-hand column, we have area under the disease progress curve and basically that's just a metric showing you disease progression over time. So a higher number means you have more disease more quickly. The letters just indicate whether or not it was statistically different. And basically we had five different isolates. There were differences between them and at least in Cabernet Sauvignon, we could say that not isolates were the same. And this is again, this, this is all tying back to diversity of the pathogen and resistance breeding. So we wanted to take this to the next phase. So for this one, this is all work that was done by Cameron Saunders, who was a former Fresno State graduate who worked in my lab. And we evaluated table grape cultivars. We also evaluated some breeding lines from the USDA program, including Sol Brio, which was one of our newer releases. And then we also included four sources of resistance to Pierce's disease slash tolerance. Now I'm not going to go into all the details about how disease looked in each of these, but just to kind of give you showcase the general idea of what we were seeing. We had two different isolates that we evaluated, isolate N001, which you can see in the left hand highlighted column, and isolate stag is leap, which is in the right hand column. And everything got a disease score. And our disease score is just basically susceptible, moderately susceptible, or highly susceptible with increasing disease severity. Similarly for bacteria, for the same two isolates, we, just, we looked at whether their bacteria levels in the plant were high, medium, or low. And basically what we found were that Red Globe and Scarlet Royal were the, had the most disease and the highest levels of bacteria. Now this is, well, I guess the, the good way of saying it is this is good in the sense that our um, greenhouse or our greenhouse data is reflective of what people have observed in the field, that Red Globe and Scarlet Royal are very susceptible or sensitive to Pierce's disease. So for example, if you're gonna be growing grapes in a high um, risk area for Pierce's disease, you're probably not gonna wanna grow these two, or Solbrio, by the way. Um, Flame Seedless had fewer disease symptoms and lower levels of bacteria. And this is actually consistent with what some of the growers that we work with in Texas have been seeing where they've said, hey, you know, flame seedless seems to be a little bit more resistant, but there hadn't actually been data showing this. So this actually supported our data. So it was really great to see that our greenhouse data is reflective of what's happening in the field. But also we were able to see that there are differences between the two isolates. And this is something that you're gonna, this kind of led us to say, okay, well, there were differences in isolates if we use Cabernet Sauvignon, which we also included in this study here just as a control. 
we also see those same kinds of differences, whether we're using Autumn Royal or a breeding line or Cab Sauv. So it looks like this is consistent and that there are differences in isolates. So we've actually taken it to the next step. We now have a field trial going on using Cab Sauv, which is being tested against 20 different isolates of um, Xylella fastidiosa. We're repeating this in the greenhouse as well, just to make sure that our field data and our greenhouse data match up. But more importantly, we're also taking those sources of resistance and we're testing them against multiple isolates of Xylella. So when I showed you the data a slide ago, I showed you the cultivars. What I did not show you were the sources of resistance and we did see differences between them based on the two isolates that we were evaluating. So in this case, we now have those same four sources of resistance, but we're testing them against multiple isolates to see how durable this is. Because again, this is something that matters when you're breeding. So we're about eight weeks into this, to the first round of this experiment. The second ex round is only five weeks in. And we've been evaluating disease progression for both our virulent study with the Cabernet, but also the durability study looking at how these resistant grapes are able to hold up. And it's all ongoing. We have another six weeks of evaluations to do, but I can be, at this point, I can tell you that we do see differences, very clear differences between isolates and the amount of disease that they can cause, both whether we're talking about the Cabernet or whether we're talking about some of these sources of resistance. So even though we're breeding for resistance and this is something that we're working on, we do have to take this into consideration and think about maybe combining resistance from different sources to make something that's gonna last longer. Okay, so for the last half, I just wanna switch gears real quick and tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing with the fruit quality side. Obviously, fruit quality is going to be essential for any cultivar that we're releasing moving forward. And there are a lot of different things that go into fruit quality. When I, some of the work that we do focuses on cluster architecture. We've been spending a lot of time and energy on great berry texture. So trying to develop um, better methods and tools for selection of grapes with nice crisp texture and also juiciness. And when I say juiciness, it's, a quite, it's not just a when you bite how much, how juicy is it, but it's how much juice can be released from a berry when you squish it. So we're, we're doing both those sides. Um, we also do some work with phenology, trying to develop earlier ripening grapes, whether it's from the raisin side, the table or the wine. And then we spend a little bit of effort on novelty traits, which these are things related to berry shape, um, berry rachis color combinations, berry flavors, things that are more aesthetic or specialty items that aren't kind of your basic um, standard package when you're producing a cultivar. Okay. So for the last couple minutes, all I want to do is tell you about some of the work that we're doing to develop molecular tools for selecting for fruit quality. And the reason this matters is because when you're working with grapes, if you can evaluate cluster size, berry size, cluster um, berry texture, when your plants are at the seedling stage like this, that saves you time and money and resources that you would have to put you know, to spend putting your vine into the field, maintaining it for two to three, two to five years while you're doing evaluations. So this is a way that we can really speed up the process and kind of cut down the amount of time it takes to develop a new cultivar. So we work with two major populations that I'm working with right now are the 113527 and the Tamiami, which is this one right here. And basically the important things to know are that these populations, when I say populations, um, what I mean is we had two great parents, we crossed them for a set of progeny. So all of these within a population individuals share two parents. So there's a genetic relatedness that we can work with. And they segregate for a lot of different traits, whether it's cluster architecture, berry color, berry size, berry texture, flowering time. And so these are the different kinds of traits that we could potentially work with here. So the one that I'm going to talk most about is cluster architecture. And that's something because I think it, it really showcases the difficulty of working with some of these traits. So there are several different common grape cluster shapes. If you're working with table grapes, you're pretty much limited to these. But what makes up cluster shape? 
Is it your, and there, the answer is there are a lot of things and each of these things have different levels of effects. So your branch number can have an effect. The angle of your branches can have an effect on cluster architecture. Um, berry size, berry number can affect the tightness of your cluster. So these are all things that you have to think about. And when you're breeding, you have to try and pick which ones are the most important to select for. So one way that we're working with this is we're doing 2D image analysis. So a lot of this data was collected by Alana Burns, who's a technician in the lab at the moment. And we've been collecting images of berries or clusters with and without berries the past several years. We've also been scanning the berries. So we cut them in half, we put them on a flatbed scanner and um, we get data that way, as well as some phenology data. Now, just because we have these images doesn't mean that we can automatically convert that into a useful number that we can work with. So we've partnered with Amy Tab, who's with the USDA ARS in West Virginia. Amy's developed algorithms to extract information about the berry scans. So berry shape, berry size, how round are these berries? Um, you may or may not be able to know us, but we can also see seeds in them a lot of times. So can we, can we evaluate seed trace size this way? Amy's also working with our cluster images, which are on the left-hand side, and trying to pull out information like cluster tightness, density, um, branch number, which you can't see on that one because there are berries. But when we remove the berries, obviously, you can see those heights. So Amy's trying to extract all that information as well. So at this point, we have all kinds of traits that we can work with whether it's berry shape size, texture, phenology, like flowering time, um, cluster shape, cluster weight. So these are all things we've been collecting since about 2016 when I first came onto the site. And when I say mapping, um, basically all I mean, stay with me here, uh, basically all I mean is that partnering with Avitus Gen, we've been able to develop genetic maps for each of these populations. And a genetic map is essentially just, it's like a road map. You have all these little lines on it and each line denotes a position on the genome. You're not adding anything, you're not taking any way, anything away, it's just like a little tag or an address. And what we can do is we can take our traits of interest, our fruit quality traits, so for example, say berry size, and we can do some statistical analyses and say, okay, Berry size is correlated or associated with what tags? And maybe it's associated with these three tags. And so what we can do then, because we know what a tag is, we know what it looks like, we know what it says, we can look to see which of those seedlings that we have has that tag. So it's, it's not a perfect relationship, but it helps us better predict individuals who have the traits we want. And that's kind of the goal with what we're working for here. So at this point, we've done that for the berry traits, we've done that for some of our phenology, and we've done that for some of our cluster traits. So this is stuff that we've done in collaboration with Avinash Karn, who's with Cornell, Lance Kittle Davidson, who's at USDA, and then Lizy De Morera and Matt Clark, who are at University of Minnesota. And we've been able to develop markers for seed trace size, which for the table grape side is really exciting because it's not just seedless versus seeded, it's seedless and how big is that seed tray size? Um, we've also got some QTLs or some markers that we're developing for berry size and berry weight. So can we select for grapes that have naturally larger berries? Um, we also have traits that we've done for flowering time. So can we have earlier flowering berry or earlier, earlier, earlier flowering clusters? Sorry. And again, this just goes back to the point that this is again for management. So when we develop these tools, we develop these resources, whether it's durable resistance for Pierce's disease, or we're developing markers for good cluster architecture, early flowering, larger berry size. The idea is that these are all tools and resources to be able to improve our selection to more rapidly evaluate and develop high quality grapes, whether it's table, raisin, or wine grapes. Um, so with that, um, like I said, this was really just more of an overview to show you some of the different projects that we were doing. The work that I showed you was primarily done, so these are all the people in my lab, Jeff and Alana have done a lot of this work. 
we've had a number of undergrads over the years who've contributed. There's a lot of just labor involved with collecting and imaging grapes. Um, VitusGen has helped a lot with the genetic maps and some of the other work. And then our funding sources here, we've had a lot of really good support from the industry, both from the Table Grape Commission, from Solid Aid Pest District, CDFA, and other groups um, to keep this pro program and some of these projects going. Um, and with that, I will thank anyone for their attention. If we have questions, and just because it's fun, this is what it looks like when we do our texture analysis. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. That looks pretty brutal for a texture analysis. I mean, so, it's fun. <laughs> what type of data do you extract from that? Just out of curiosity. A force. So when we do the texture analysis, it goes through the berries once, it comes back up and it goes through twice. So it basically evaluates, that's like first bite, second bite. And so it measures how much your berries bounce back after the first bite. So it's like springiness and chewiness. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a whole line of research that we started probably two years ago now. It's been really exciting. Okay. All right. Um, do we have any questions? Does not look like we're getting questions from the audience. So just a brief, um, Reminder to everybody, please type your questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of your, of your screen and we will um, get to those questions when we, um, when we finish the program. Uh, I actually have a quick question for, for Rachel before, before you disappear. Okay, still here. You go back, okay. Um, so when you, when you do uh, selections and you do resistance um, checks and all these things on, on new grapes, uh, do you see a difference between seedless and seeded grapes? Is there, is there an influence on, on any disease resistance? So, okay. So there were thoughts that table grapes, for example, Pierce's disease, perfect example. There were thoughts that table grapes were more sensitive to Pierce's disease than wine grapes. Um, when we did our evaluation, we didn't necessarily find that to be true. It's more cultivar specific. So like okay. Autumn King gets everything, right? Autumn King gets powdery mildew like crazy, it gets botrytis like crazy. It isn't necessarily more susceptible because it's a table grape. It's just because of the genetic background that went into it. So I, we don't necessarily, I don't, at least with all the screenings and evaluations I've done, I don't see a very nice, clear distinction between wine versus table. It's generally a, what is the genetic background that you're working with? Okay, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't have any more questions. Um, so before we take a really short break, um, I want to show you another video. Um, and this time it will feature um, our winery and it's, it's just a two minute video, then we will take a, a few minutes uh, break and shortly after 10 o'clock, uh, according to the program at 10.04, we will introduce um, the, uh, the next speaker. So you have just enough time to get yourself a sip of water, but there's a, um, a little video first and then we take the break. <laughs> Fresno State's winery is nationally respected as the first commercially bonded winery on a university campus. Students receive valuable, hands-on experience in all areas of winemaking, preparing them to become tomorrow's professional winemakers. From crushing to pressing, fermenting, bottling, marketing, and distributing, our students are prepared for every job in the wine industry. Our campus winery vineyards, and classrooms serve as the perfect locations to teach students the science of winemaking and all of its applications. All this one-of-a-kind experience makes our students and alumni highly sought after by wineries around the world. Each year, students produce up to 10,000 cases sold throughout the Central Valley and online. We use high-quality grapes from our 120-acre campus vineyard and other regions throughout the state including Northern California, 
and the Sierra foothills. The Fresno State Winery takes pride in the more than 300 awards it has received since 1997 for its 20 varieties of red, white, and rosé wines. Thanks to industry support, the winery offers updated facilities, giving students access to current winemaking methods, equipment, and technology. Join our Fresno State Wine Club, or stop by the Gibson Farm Market to enjoy the Central Valley's favorite wines, made by our dedicated team of Fresno State students. Okay, we will be back for you in about five minutes.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, our next presenter is um, Dr. Christy Sun. Uh, she's an enology professor in the Department of Viticulture and Enology. Um, and she will share her research uh, on the impact, uh, impact of deficit irrigation and mechanical leafing on yield and berry wine composition of Cabernet Sauvignon in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, Dr. Sun received her PhD from Cornell University um, where she studied chemosensory and uh, viticultural studies of hybrid grapes and the resulting wines. Her focus is on grape and wine aroma, flavor uh, compound identification, and the impact of viticultural practices on grape and wine quality, as well as developing new analytical techniques for measuring grape and wine um, components. So, um, Christy, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Summer. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. So today I will talk about one of my research projects that is the Im impact of depth irrigation and mechanical leafing on yield and berry wine composition of Cabernet Sonia in the San Joaquin Valley. So this is a project um, collaborated between uh, Fresno State and uh, University of California Cooperative Extension. Um, it's a three year project pretty long project, but I really enjoy this project and working with my partners. Um, most of you know Judge John is our Fresno uh, uh, farm advisor, so um, he led the team and complete all the field work. And we also got a lot of support from um, Madeira farm advisor, Carl Lott. I really appreciate his support. And my team include undergrad student and a graduate student, uh, made the wine and uh, uh, did all the lab work. So as I said, this is a three years project. Um, so far we have completed two years work. Um, so today I am gonna show you two years result. Um, I will talk about the background of this project, you know, why we do this project and how we design the research, and then followed by result, conclusion, and future plans. So if you have any question, please feel free uh, to type in QA session. Um, you know, the San Joaquin Valley is a very big grape and wine production area. Um, the Crush District 11, 12, 13, and 14 contain 40% of wine grape acreage and across 70% of wine grape in California. So it's very big uh, grape area. Um, in previous years, you know, grape growers, the priority has been focusing on the yield. It is very easy to understand because they want to get more profit. But nowadays, based on the marketing survey, wine consumer are moving towards a high quality wine. So really the fruit quality becomes very critical. Also nowadays, um, the labor cost is increasing every, day, every year. So it is very challenging for, uh, for grape growers in San Joaquin Valley to get more profit. Um, so um, as a grape grower, they have to not just focus on the yield, but also the quality. So in terms of the uh, fruit quality, so what is the fruit quality? Typically, we use a total soluble solid, bricks, right? Um, most of the region use the bricks to determine the harvest date. But actually, uh, other compounds, acidity, phenolics, flavor, aroma compounds is also very, very important um, because the good wine is really depend on the balance. Every element needs to be balance very well. In terms of the aroma compound, um, we say what kind of compound is uh, aroma compound is good, what is bad for our wine, it really depends on the grape variety and the wine style. For example, when we talk about, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, especially uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, uh, we like, you know, the green and uh, bell pepper flavor, so the green compound like massage prison and the cystic compound is good for Sonia Brown. But for our red wine, Cabernet Sonia, 
if we have too much green compound, it's really not good for, for it. But we can use uh, you know, cannabis management. For example, we can use uh, um, a leaf removal to ex expose the vine to light. And also we can use uh, um, depth irrigation to control the vine vigor, um, to try to control this kind of uh, green aroma compound in the very early stage in the vineyard, not, not wait to very late time. Um, so for the Cabernet Sauvignon in San Joaquin Valley, it is the second most crushed variety just behind the Chardonnay. Uh, so it's very important uh, uh, grape variety, one, uh, grape variety. Uh, for San Joaquin Valley, um, produce more than 53%. So it's a lot of production in San Joaquin Valley. But we know uh, we have very hard growing um, condition here in San Joaquin Valley. So it is really not ideal region for good quality Cabernet Sauvignon. You know, our berry short of acidity because the tartaric acid or malic acid they degrade in the hot temperature. And also our berry short of uh, uh, color compound like isocyanin and also other phenolic compounds. So it's really challenge for grape grower to produce a high quality Cabernet Sauvignon here. So the um, sorry about that. So the objective of our project is to identify the optimal water deficit and timing of mechanical leafing or Cabernet Sauvignon uh, in Madeira to improve berry as a signing, reduce the green aroma compound, but maintain the desired year because the year is still important for the uh, grape grower. And also we want to improve the wine quality. So the um, research is conducted in a commercial vineyard uh, at Madeira. Uh, we use uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Freedom Brew Stock. And uh, so uh, low is 10 feet apart and the vine is four feet apart in northeast to southwest row orientation. The vine are quadrilateral rod, cordon trained and spur pruned under a sparring system. So this is a very typical uh, uh, California sparring system. We use three, uh, uh, two depth irrigation treatment and three mechanical leafing treatment. Uh, for the depth irrigation, uh, we use a 50% ETC from fruit set to verizon, then followed by 80% ETC from verizon to harvest. So this is the first treatment. So here ET means uh, evapotranspiration. The second treatment is 80% ETC from fruit set all the way to harvest. For mechanical leafing, we have three treatments. First is a uh, treat at bloom time, and second is a berry set. Uh, three is a no leafing as a control. So here is a picture shows how we set up uh, deficit irrigation. So the vineyard uh, uses uh, drip irrigation. Uh, each one has two emitter. Um, here is our um, mechanical leaf uh, removal treatment. Um, so we use a, um, a rollover leaf plucker so the machine can defoliate a 60 centimeter windows in the fruiting zone. So here I have a, a video, hope it works. Okay, so that picture shows how we do the leaf removal. And then you can see um, um, before river removal and after river removal, you can see the big difference, right? The, the, the canopy is more um, opened after the reef removal. Um, so here's a couple of pictures. Our student is uh, working on the field. Uh, so the left, left picture, uh, one of my, our students is uh, test the uh, leaf water potential by uh, pressure bond. The right side, the student is using a solar panel to test the uh, shaded area of the canopy. So all these tests is to 
uh, monitor the water centers to achieve a very successful deficit irrigation uh, program. Uh, here, our student is testing the fruit zone for the synthetically actively radiation, uh, PAR. Um, so the PAR means uh, how much light the vine can use to photosynthesis. So here is our harvest team work very hard in the field. And here is our wine making team. We got a lot of berry from the uh, vineyard. <clears throat> so here's our, uh, our wine making method. Um, so our student, you know, uh, first uh, did a berry distem and a crush. And then we did a cold soak for three days. Um, so before uh, yeast inoculation, we um, uh, sample some uh, juice. Um, so this is uh, the juice amount for all the treatment. You can see the um, big difference among the treatment in terms of color. So that is very encouraging for us. Um, so before the inauguration, we test all the juice basic composition because we want to make a very good wine. Um, so we have uh, so six treatment uh, wine. So you can see um, the pH is very high, all above four. So that's really not good, right? Uh, really short of uh, the uh, tartaric acid. And also the yen uh, is a nitrogen compound. Uh, it's, uh, the concentration is pretty low. So um, before inauguration, we adjusted all these numbers. So we adjust the pH 3.65 to 3.7. And we add the nutrient and DAP to adjust the yen content to 250 uh, milligram per liter. Then we inoculate the yeast, uh, EC111A. So why we use this yeast? Because this is a pretty uh, neutral uh, yeast, will not affect the, the wine flavor profile because we only are uh, uh, interested in the how uh, vineyard treatment affect the wine quality. We don't want the yeast affect our wine. Um, so during the whole uh, echo fermentation, our students work very hard, they monitor every day. Um, and they patch down the cap uh, twice per day. Um, about uh, seven days, uh, we finished a cup fermentation. Then the wine was pressed by a bladder press. Why we use a bladder press? Um, because uh, we can control the pressure. Uh, so all treatments have exactly the same pressure. Then we add the uh, uh, nutrient and inoculate the bacteria. Uh, uh, initiate the malic fermentation. So the mal malic fermentation um, uh, was about uh, half, half a month. And then, you know, we add uh, free SO2 and the cold stabilization for about one month. Then we finally bottle the wine. Okay, now let's look at the uh, two years data. So this is a table showed the uh, uh, yield component in 2018. Uh, this is our first year uh, data. So you can see 50% um, ET um, actually decreased the yield about 20% compared to 80% ET. So if we do heavy depth irrigation, we definitely lose the yield. So why we lose the yield? Because um, after the depth irrigation, we get a less uh, cluster per vine. Also, we get a smaller berry. You know, smaller berry is good for high quality wine, but we have to sacrifice our yield. Um, for the mechanical leaf removal, our treatment does not affect the yield. That is very good. Um, so all the treatment have pretty similar yield. So this data, year data for uh, second year, 2019, pretty similar um, pattern. Um, so again, 50% ET heavy depth irrigation definitely um, reduce the, um, the yield. And again, the mechanical leaf removal didn't affect the yield um, component. 
Um, for the very um, basic chemistry component, uh, breaks pH TA, we didn't find a big difference. Um, in 2018, only uh, the TA from 50% ET treatment have a little bit lower. Other than, other than that, it's pretty similar. Um, for the 2019, we found 20% ET treatment have a little bit lower breaks. Uh, we um, uh, think because uh, in 2019, we harvest uh, berry a little bit late, is the, the end of uh, October. So we got a, a couple of days of raining. So that might, you know, the reason uh, have a little bit lower bricks uh, number. So how about the isocyanin and IBMP? So isocyanin, again, is a color co uh, compound. IBMP is a green aroma compound. If you don't know IBMP, so you can um, smell the bell pepper. So that's the uh, uh, IBMP um, uh, aroma. Um, so from this table, you can see um, both the depth irrigation and the mechanical leaf removal include as a signing. So that means makes the uh, uh, berry have better color, right? So that's very, very good. Um, for the IBMP, 50% uh, ET, heavy depth, heavy depth irrigation reduce green aroma. So that's pretty good. Um, for the mechanical leaf removal, uh, only blue set reduce the IBMP. At the bloom time, actually increase a little bit. Um, but, you know, all this concentration of IBMP is below 5 nanogram per liter um, because the IBMP, the sensory threshold is 5 nanogram per liter. So all this number is below to 5. So that's not a big problem. Um, so how about wine composition? So after, you know, a uh, bottle of wine, we test all the basic wine composition. So we try to keep 3SO2 and the pH are same because SO2 and the pH level will affect the wine color. So we want to keep this parameter the same. Then we can compare how vineyard treatment affects the wine color. So here SO2, free SO2, we keep 30 ppm. The pH, we keep at around 3.65. And we also keep the, uh, the alcohol content around 14%. So the VA, uh, uh, VA content, we control very, very low. Um, in terms of wine color in 2018, uh, so you can see 50% ET uh, heavy depth irrigation improves the wine color compared to 80%. Um, for the 50% ET, we found if we do leaf removal at a blue set, actually will improve the wine color. In 2019, we also, sorry about that. We also made a wine from 100% uh, ETC. Um, so you can see 50% ETC, 80% ECT have much better color compared to 100% ETC. So that's the irrigation really work. Um, also um, for the um, both 50% and 80% uh, leaf removal at the broom and the brew set. Um, improve the wine color. Um, in 2019, we also made uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Sauvignon wine from different wine regions across uh, California, like Livermore, Linden, McFarland, and Payson's, San Lucas. So we made a lot of wine in 2019. So we compare our treatment of wine our San Joaquin Valley wine to the other region, Cabernet Sauvignon. So from this table, you can see our 50% ET uh, with the leaf removal at the broom. This treatment uh, is comparable to the Cabernet Sauvignon from Linden, 
in terms of color. So it's, that is very, very uh, encouraging for us. Um, so in conclusion, based on two years uh, uh, data, um, depth irrigation improves the berry as a sign in one color and the reduced berry IBMP. Mechanical leafing at the broom yields the highest berry color and a slightly um, higher IBMP. Uh, in terms of yield, uh, depth irrigation, you know, reduced about 20% because, you know, the smaller berry size and uh, uh, less cluster number. But mechanical leafing doesn't impact the yield. So, you know, based on this uh, result, as a great uh, grower, you really need to uh, think about, you know, if you want to make a beautiful, um, high quality berry, you need, you will sacrifice some yield if you use a depth irrigation. But if you use a mechanical leafing, it will not affect the yield, also improves the uh, quality. Um, so what's the next? Uh, we will complete the third year try in um, 2020. So actually, uh, you know, one of my students is working in the lab to test the berry now. They are working very hard. And uh, also we'll do a sensory evaluation um, uh, once the situation gets better. And also, we are working with uh, uh, Fresno State Agriculture Business um, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Uh, Sohe Asai. We are uh, doing the cost an analysis for this project uh, in order to give more guidance for grape growers. We uh, would like to thank Agriculture Research Institute and American Vineyard Foundation uh, ETS lab and also Sewaki Valley uh, wine growers and the wineries for their big support. Really appreciate. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is my um, presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Christy. It looks like we have a few um, questions for you. Did you, okay, the first question, did you try natural yeast, no inoculation? No, <laughs> we inoculate uh, um, all the uh, must with uh, EC111A. The second one question, comment regarding yield, would it be interesting to analyze what happens when lower yields are utilized would you consider future tests using vineyard with uh, low yield, four to 60 ton per acre? Um, for, you know, for the Cabernet Sauvignon, yeah. Uh, so San Joaquin Valley, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, the, you know, the, uh, the yield usually is uh, pretty high, the way much higher than 4.6 ton per acre. So right now we will not, um, do the uh, test for the low yield. But uh, yeah, that's possibility. We'll see if, uh, um, yeah, if, yeah, if we have a uh, you know, chance, we, are, we definitely can try it. Thanks for this question. Next one, would you expect dropping cluster before or after Verizon would improve the wine color? Okay, that's really good question. Um, so um, we did, uh, um, leaf removal, but we didn't do the um, uh, class removal. Um, but that's a pretty good suggestion. Uh, yeah, very, very good suggestion. Well, uh, think about that. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I think you have time for one more question. Um, before we have to move on, all the other questions uh, will be will be answered in a um, okay, text form. One more question: Did the depth irrigation impact the nutrient on tank of the vine? That's really a good question. How that affect nutrient uh, uptake? Um, so for this project, we didn't 
test uh, new trend. <laughs> That's very, very interesting. It, I think it might affect, but now I don't have a, a, a data to, uh, to support. Um, yes, if I have time, I really want to test how it affects uh, the, the berry nutrient. Yeah, thanks for your uh, question. Do we have more time? We have another question. What was the impact of death irrigation and the leafing on fruit tanning level and the crystal concentration? Yeah, very good question. Um, how is that tannin and other phenolic compounds? You know, I got the uh, same question from uh, when I did a presentation in other meeting. Yes, it's very, it uh, will affect, but we just don't have a, a time to test it. Uh, yeah, it's very, very interesting because we um, did a short sensory evaluation. We, we find the, the difference, you know, in terms of mouse feel. So it definitely will affect the tannin content. Yes, thank you for question, Joe. Okay, thank you very much, Christy. Um, thanks everybody for the for the great questions. If you have more questions, please um, keep typing them into the Q and A section, and we will answer them at the end of the event. Okay, now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Stephen Summer, the Director of the Viticulture and Energy Research Center. Dr. Summer joined us in the spring of 2019. Before he joined us, he was a pro program director and assistant professor of fermentation science at uh, Appalachian State University in North Carolina. He has many years of industry experience in various beverage production. Dr. Summer's main research focus on is physical product stability, beverage microbiology, and the one agent. In his position at Fresno State, he will emphasize and further develop research in the areas of grape growing, wine chemistry, and wine production. So today, Dr. Summer will give, give you a topic of polysaccharide use in the wine production. So it is very useful for winery. So now, welcome Dr. Summer. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I want to talk about polysaccharides in, um, in wine production because it is a topic that is um, overlooked in many cases when it comes to physical stability in wine. So when you finish your, um, your wine right before bottling, you usually look at different aspects of stability. So you have biological stability, which includes all your yeast and bacteria that could potentially re-ferment your wine with chemical stability, mostly preventing oxidation, preventing any chemical changes during aging and during the shelf life of your product. And then we have this huge area of physical stability which in most cases is limited to protein stability and tartrate stability. Protein stability, it is really straightforward because you, you add bentonite um, and you basically um, remove your proteins from your wine uh, prior to bottling. For tartrate stability, in, in some cases, um, cold stabilization is good enough also use additives um, to stabilize your, your tartrates like carboxymethylcellulose um, or manoprotein. And manoprotein is a, is a very interesting one because you can use it to stabilize your tartrates, but you can also use it to stabilize your proteins, which basically affects this whole area of physical stability in your wine. The problem that we have is when we use these polysaccharides, um, we have matrix interactions, we have um, precipitation, so we lose some of that fining agent. And in order to understand what these interactions are based on, um, I did a lot of work um, in, the, in the past few years um, to characterize what's happening. 
and to make it easier for, for winemakers to use these products and, and predict the behavior in their wine. So we know that tannins react with proteins. We know that some of those polysaccharides that come from the grapes and some of those polysaccharides that come from your yeast interact with tannins and, and proteins and prevent that uh, precipitation from happening. Other polysaccharides precipitate proteins and precipitate tannins. Um, and it's, it's really uh, interesting to, to see what these polysaccharides can do to your wine, either as a fining agent or as a stabilizing agent. So in order to, um, to understand that a little bit better, we built prediction models and we built model systems, so model wine essentially, and we use different types of, uh, of tannins, different types of proteins and different types of polysaccharides to understand um, what these interactions look like. So when you look at, at healthy um, grape material, you usually have pectins and glucans in your, in your grapes different concentrations depending on the grape variety, depending on how well you extract those compounds. But between 200 and 1000 ppm is usually a safe concentration to assume. So quite, um, quite a lot of polysaccharide material in your, in your juice. Then you add polysaccharides from your organisms. So manoproteins, mannanes, glucanes coming from your fermenting yeast, coming from any type of infection that you might have, coming from botrytis and, and um, bacterial infections. So um, around 750 ppm in addition to the, uh, the polysaccharides that come from the grape material. So you have a lot of polysaccharides compared to other components like proteins and tannins. Your polysaccharides can make up the majority of macromolecules in your, in your wine. And they have different charges. So the, the model polysaccharides that we've been using in our, in our trials um, can have a negative charge, a neutral charge, or a charge that uh, strongly depends on the pH of your wine, which makes it even less predictable. But what we know is that pectin and manoprotein are the two most important ones in your, in your grapes. And the other ones um, we just use to understand the impact of, uh, of charge on, on those interactions. So let's talk about manoproteins for, for just a second. There are a lot of commercial products on the market um, for manoproteins for different reasons. Some are marketed towards um, physical stability. Some are marketed towards um, tartrate st uh, stability specifically. And as uh, for tartrate stability, we know how it works. Um, the protein basically coats your crystals and prevents them um, from growing. And those, those glycoproteins, those manoproteins are coming from your yeast cell wall. So once your yeast starts to, starts to die off, those manoproteins are released from your fermenting yeast, or you can add them um, to your fermentation or after fermentation uh, from some of those manufacturers that offer them. It's usually around 25 grams per 100 liters where you uh, achieve stability and there is no known degradation over time. So your um, protective effect that you get is, is pretty much long term. The only negative side effect that we've seen is color stability in red wine. There are studies that show that, that manoproteins can precipitate your color compounds and basically decolorize your, uh, your red wine to some extent. But there are a lot of positive effects of, of manoproteins on mouthfeel, on um, astringency. So there, there is a buffering effect of these, of these compounds. When you look at the model wine and how these manoproteins can interact with other components over time, we did a, a model wine that had all the components in it uh, that normal wine would have just a little bit um, more controlled. So 13% alcohol, pH 3.5, all the tens and, and proteins and wine concentration. And you can see the majority of, of polysaccharides that you add have a buffering effect. That's the, the zone in the middle where you don't see an increase in turbidity over time. The uh, two that actually increase are the control so you have a, a slow interaction between tannins and, and proteins over time. Um, and uh, one of the polysaccharides that we added had the same effect, but the majority actually leads to a stabilization of your equilibrium 
and no increase in, in haze formation. And this one line that is going down, those are actually your manoproteins. So you can see that the manoproteins have a very positive effect on your haze stability. So no, no haze formation, no precipitation, they effectively protect your, your wine from forming um, a, a protein tannin precipitation. We see the same thing happening in real wine, not as nice and clean as, as in this picture, but it's um, definitely the same effect. And what happens is you have this, this mixture of proteins, you have polyphenols in your wine, and you have positively charged, negatively charged, and neutral polysaccharides. When you look at the interaction and what we think happens um, with no polysaccharides, there's a, a interaction between your proteins and your polyphenols forming a precipitation in the haze over time. Your negatively charged polysaccharides will now interact with your protein material that has a positive charge and prevent those proteins from interacting with your tannins. So they can effectively stabilize your macromolecules in suspension or in solution in your wine. Pos positively charged polysaccharides do essentially the same thing, but those usually hold on to tannin material because tannins have a negative net charge, so an overall negative charge. So you have a stronger interaction between these, those positively charged polysaccharides and your tannins. The neutral polysaccharides increase your particle size and increase turbidity. So those are the ones that are causing the most problems during the shelf life of your wine because they will create a precipitation over time. So with this model, with those charge uh, interactions, we have a pretty solid idea um, what is happening in your, uh, in your wine over time. So where do these uh, polysaccharides come from? This is a very old um, picture, uh, 93, but it's still true to this day. Um, your polysaccharides are constantly extracted during um, your wine production. So why color and anthocyanins and tannins increase a lot faster because they are, um, to a large extent, uh, easier water soluble. Your polysaccharides um, are hard to extract from the berry skin. They're hard to extract from the pulp of your berries. And some of that material is only soluble in ethanol. So only once you completed fermentation, you can actually extract the majority of those um, hydrophobic polysaccharides. So, <clears throat> extended maceration has been a, um, a very common tool to extract more polysaccharides into your wine, but that's obviously only an option in red wine. If you're making white wines where you don't allow um, skin contact, um, you have to add purified polysaccharides to your wine in order to have that same effect. Um, unless we're talking about a barrel-aged Chardonnay where you get manoprotein extraction from your yeast during barrel aging, but it's probably the exception when it comes to, um, to white wine making. Um, carboxymethylcellulose is also a very interesting one because it tells us a lot about polysaccharides and how they react in wine. So I want to use that as an example to show you uh, some of the problems that can be caused by, by polysaccharides in, in wine production. So again, a few commercial examples. This is not a complete list. There are many producers of carboxymethylcellulose for, for wine production. We usually use it as a, as a thickener in, in products in like toothpaste and baked goods and ice cream, but it is allowed uh, in wine at a legal limit of 100 ppm, but it is limited to white wines and sparkling wines because it causes problems in um, it works the same way as your manoprotein. It attaches to the crystal and prevents it from growing. So the crystals essentially um, don't grow to the size where they would precipitate out of your wine and show up in your bottle. It is um, a relatively short-term effect. Um, as I said, it, it's uh, only recommended for white wines and I would personally only recommend it if you sell it relatively fast. Um, but in red wines, it causes different problems. It was reported about 10 years ago um, that it interacts with polyphenols. 
We found out in the meantime that it really doesn't interact with polyphenols, um, but it has the ability to precipitate color, um, but only in a, a small portion of your wines. So in about 20% of the red wines that were tested in this one study, um, CMC was causing uh, problems, very unpredictable, oftentimes delayed. Um, and that led the producers of carboxymethyl cellulose and uh, some international organizations to the assumption that it's not safe for the use in red wine and they don't recommend it. But now that we know how it works and why it causes these problems, we can actually develop um, strategies to use it in red wine as well. And the way it works is it um, holds on to your protein material. So um, this was published uh, about four years ago and your CMC has two uh, potential binding sites that can interact with protein. Uh, one is pH dependent, the other one is not. So independent of your pH, CMC will always find a way to drag protein material out of your wine and by doing that, it removes color because your anthocyanins and your pigments and your tannins will hold on to your protein. So it's a protein bridged reaction that then leads to the color loss of your wine. It's not a, uh, an interaction with your anthocyanins alone. By removing protein from your wine, you can um, basically prevent that from happening. That is one, one reason why it showed up in, in red wine um, so often is because most people don't protein stabilize their red wine because they assume that the tannin material will take care of that. So they don't add bentonite to their red wine and then CMC can cause that. problem. If you have a high tannin wine, you have less protein in it and you have less problems, which explains why only 20% of the wines in that one study um, actually displayed uh, a haze after, after bottling with CMC. Um, the problem really is that delay and you can see this is a, um, a really uh, small study that we did a few years ago with a few um, grape varieties and you can see it takes up to 10 days for that haze to pick up and then it develops within just a few hours um, your product is completely hazy. And we were um, blaming polysaccharides for that, actually, um, for that delay. So we know that some of the pectin material can interact with proteins and polyphenols and uh, can prevent these interactions of, um, of large micromolecules. And we assume that at wine pH, your polysaccharides can actually do the same thing between the interaction of CMC and protein, delaying that reaction for a few days. So you feel safe, you bottle your wine, and then the haze shows up um, in your bottle. Um, so in order to, uh, to prove that, again, we did the model trials, and uh, this is the picture that I showed you earlier, where you don't see any increase um, of haze uh, when you add polysaccharides to it. But as soon as you add carboxymethylcellulose to the picture, it gets really messy. And that is an indication that CMC has a really high affinity towards protein because it's dis disrupting all these interactions. It's basically disturbing that equilibrium in your wine, making it a real challenge to work with um, if you have uh, protein material. So what we, um, what we assume at this point is that uh, your CMC is just holding on to all the protein material that it can find, dragging it out of solution, and that the delay is caused by, um, by polysaccharide material. In order to prove that, we did a few uh, pairing trials. So we, um, we added uh, polysaccharides, we added CMC, and then we added a mixture of polysaccharides and, and CMC. And we used um, ultrasound to help those molecules to interact a little faster. And what you can see in that picture is the control basically does not show any, any haze formation. There's a little bit of haze with only polysaccharides, a lot of haze with your CMC, um, and a reduced haze of polysaccharides and CMC. So the polysaccharides really have a buffering effect. And when you look at those last two columns, 
the ultrasound also has an effect. So when you, um, when you treat your, uh, your mixture with ultrasound, those molecules unfold a little faster and interact faster, which leads to a st statistically significant difference between those two. Um, and that means the, the long-term effect of, um, of that protection um, basically wears off. So uh, when you add CMC, you might not see an immediate effect, but the effect will, um, will show up uh, hours, uh, days um, um, after the treatment, which is uh, essentially good news for us because we know how to fix the problem by removing your protein material. But there's also some, still some unknowns what, uh, what polysaccharides um, can do over time. And we're still working on, on those questions in, in view. So just as a, a brief conclusion, um, your proteins are just as diverse as your polysaccharides. So when you, uh, when you use model systems, when you try to, to combine different compounds in, in wine, um, there's a lot of oversimplification that we're doing, but by looking at these these effects in specific detail, we can learn a lot uh, about what's happening in, in your wine. Polysaccharides can influence protein polyphenol interactions. That's probably the most important um, take home message. And manoproteins are the most important group of those um, polysaccharides because they stabilize charges, they protect macromolecules in solution, they protect your, your crystals in solution. And there is not a whole lot of long-term data, um, but what, what data we have suggests that the effect is also long-term. So your manoproteins don't degrade or inactivate over time. Um, but we don't know what effects, long-term effects on mouthfeel and astringency um, we have. Those studies um, are still, still out there. With uh, carboxyl methylcellulose in red wines, we always have a risk of haze uh, if we don't remove all the protein material from, uh, from the wine because CMC will uh, find all the protein material and will drag it out of, uh, of solution. It does not interact with polysaccharides, polyphenols, anthocyanins alone. It needs your protein to cause uh, a problem. And that delay is, uh, is due to, um, to polysaccharides in, uh, in your wine. The um, effect in a, in a red wine uh, matrix obviously depends on your polysaccharide extraction and degradation. Um, and we've done trials uh, in 2019 um, to that effect and uh, the data will be out there soon, but it basically proves what we've already shown in, um, in model wine. Um, those polysaccharides are much more important for long-term stability and shelf life than we uh, previously assumed. Um, with this, I want to thank you for your attention and I hope we have time for questions. Do we have any questions? No. Doesn't look like we have questions. Um, so if you, again, if you uh, come up with questions, um, please type them into, into the, um, the Q&A section. Um, with this, it is uh, time for our final presentation of Grape Day before we, we start our uh, final Q&A and, um, and wrap up session. Um, and the final presentation will feature uh, Dr. Miguel Pedrosa and two of his graduate students. Um, they are in the Jordan Agricultural Research Center now. So this is a presentation with a live demonstration um, from the, the sensory lab. You can read more about the facility and the sensory facility in the program and on our website. Um, we have a special feature of uh, the Jordan Agricultural Research Center there. Um, Dr. Pedrosa joined um, the department as a professor, assistant professor in enology in August um, 2017. He has a PhD in enology from the University of Castilla-La Mancha in Spain, um, where he specialized in grape and wine analysis and strategies for converting grape mark into an enology additive. Um, 
during his uh, postdoctoral research, um, he explored how wine uh, chemosensory stimuli together with genetic traits modulate our sensory experience of wine flavor. Today's presentation will include a live demonstration, as I said, um, and it will include two of his graduate students, um, Corey Monk and Robert Harrell. Um, Robert has uh, graduated from UC Davis in 2017 with a, a Bachelor in Chemical Engineering, and he spent two years in wineries throughout California, Missouri, and New Zealand um, before he joined the master's program in 2019, where he's studying with uh, Dr. Petrosa um, on the use of bio uh, potentials as a tool for measuring emotional response to wine odorants. And the second uh, graduate student is Corey Monk. Um, she has a bachelor's degree in enology from Fresno State um, and she uh, worked with Dr. Uh, Pedrosa in the past um, on um, undergraduate student research and she's continuing her graduate student research um, with him as well. So with this I hand the floor over to Miguel. Thank you very much, Estefan, and thank you very much, uh, to Cynthia and the Center for the Organization of Grape Day. Thank you to all the attendees that uh, waited till the end. Uh, we really appreciate. And um, as, a, as a final dish in today's menu, we're going to introduce you to the technique that we're using to add more spice into sensory analysis. Uh, specifically focusing on wine and odorants in wine. So as Stefan was um, uh, telling you, I'm here with two of, uh, uh, of our graduate students, Corey and Robert, and they will be walking us through uh, the, basic, uh, the basic aspects of the technique and how we are collecting biopotentials from human subjects that are smelling flavors and specifically odorants or aroma in wine. So with this, I'm going to yield the floor to Corey. Okay, hi everybody. Again, I'm Corey and I'm going to get us started with a brief introduction. So uh, from the stimuli, when we taste wine on our traditional sensory methods, we taste, we use aroma, mouthfeel, and color. In the simple model, model, we consistently overlook exactly what is happening between the stimuli and our response. And we use rating as scaling and rating methods. Before these behavioral responses, we have neural processes that are occurring before our cognitive thoughts. And what we as researchers are trying to exactly understand is what is happening between our stimuli and our bio potentials. So some of these examples of neural responses are heart rate, sweat on our fingertips, and facial expressions. And so how do we record these neural responses? And we use um, electrodes. So that's what we're going to be using today. So we're gonna be demonstrating how we set up our participant. So here we are attaching electrodes to the zygomatic muscle. And that runs along our cheek and is associated with smiling. So even just a little bit of a smile, we can record these electrical charges and these electrical changes. Next, uh, still on the face, we record um, disgust on our corrugator muscle, which is uh, located above our eyebrow. So just even a movement, if you can look at my face, scrunching of the face, that shows uh, dislike. Um, here I am attaching electrodes on the non-dominant hand of our participant on the middle finger and the ring finger. And this will record uh, sweat electrical charges on a participant. Lastly, we record heart rate. And we do so by putting electrodes underneath the right and left collarbone and under the left ribbed cage. And we can see any changes in heart rate that our participant experiences. So finally, we are all set up and you can see that we are attaching wires using a wireless transmitter. And this wireless transmitter will send any changes in signal to computer. And Robert is going to be talking about 
what signals we are receiving. I'll be going over what these experiments look like when we're doing them, and like Corey said, uh, what we're seeing during them. So the experiments are guided using computer software, and each trial follows the same scheme. So there's a 20 second wait between each trial, and then subjects are told to prepare to sniff for 10 seconds. And then there's a three second sniffing window, followed by 20 more seconds of waiting. This, during this waiting, we're viewing their physiological biopotential response. And then they manually rate how they felt about that sniff. And then the next trial follows the same uh, scheme. So when we're doing these things, we focus on three things. Our software allows us to randomize the stimuli between different participants so we don't get any weird order effects. Uh, all the wait times built into the experiment allow us to minimize carryover so we know we're looking at the sniff we, we think we're looking at. And all the while we're collecting automatic physio physiology data. This is a video of me very happily following the trial scheme. So here I'm told which file to pick up with an odorant inside of it. And I'm told to prepare to sniff. And then on the right here, this is what we see in real time. And I sniff. And I replace the cap and put it back. And then there's this wait period while we view my full physiological response. And then I rate in some way how I felt about that odorant. So this is what we're seeing as people are undergoing the experiment. On the top here, we have activity in the corrugator muscle or basically the frowning muscle in the face. Below that, we have activity in the zygomaticus or smiling muscle in the face. And below that, we see heart rate. And below that, we see skin conductance, measurement of sweat in the palm. And on the very bottom channel, we have this square here, which basically tells us this was when the person was sniffing, so this is where you need to look in the data. And we're particularly interested in about 10 to 15 seconds after the sniff, and that's where we get our information. So zooming in on skin conductance, like I said, it varies with activity of the sweat glands in the hand, particularly the finger. Uh, we're looking at three major things with skin conductance. The first one is latency, or how long did it take a person to react to the stimulus? The next is rise time. How long did it take to go from baseline skin conductance to maximum? And then amplitude, what was their maximum response? Here is my personal skin conductance response to four different odorants. On the left, we have uh, positive odorants, vanillin, which smells like vanilla, linalol, which smells like Fruit Loops, and then on the right, two very negative things, a body odor scent on the top right, and box tree or cat urine on the bottom right. And if you look at these, uh, just one thing we can quickly see is for the positive odorants, there was this huge delay between smelling, uh, shown by this box, and any reaction. And for the negative odorants, there was this quick, really low latency between the stimulus and the reaction. So now I'm looking at heart rate. Uh, this is what a single heart rate heartbeat looks 
like on an EKG. Basically, the only thing we care about is this big peak. And knowing the time between these peaks, we can get the beats per minute of the participant. And we look at the change between before and after stimulus of a person's heart rate. So again, looking at these four things, you can see this huge drop for vanillin. I was apparently pretty stressed beforehand. Uh, for linalol, you see a very small change, basically nothing in beats per minute before and after being exposed to the Fruit Loop scent. And looking at the negative odorants, we see an increase in heart rate for both the body odor and the cat urine. This is typical, usually people have an increase in heart rate when they experience certain negative things. So now looking at EMG or muscle activity in those facial muscles, uh, we're always constantly reacting to things with our facial muscles, even if you can't see it in someone's face, our equipment can detect it. And it's a very fast acting signal, so your reactions occur in half a second or less. So looking at my corrugator activity, you can see pretty mild, if any, response at all for vanillin on the top left and cat urine on the bottom right. And a significant response for linalol on the bottom left and body odor on the top right. This is basically telling us maybe these scents were a little bit stronger, so it caused me to furrow my brow, and it's a measurement of possibly intensity. And then finally, the smile response. You can see moderate responses for all of the odorants, but there was this giant smile response for the body odor scent, which might seem weird, but most sensory studies have seen that smiling is less a measurement of how happy you are with some stimulus, but more how novel or intense it is. And this was clearly a very intense smell, hence my giant response. And uh, that's all for me. Now back to Dr. Pedroza. Thank you, Robert. And uh, so you may be asking yourself the question of uh, why do we care about this, uh, these measures? And uh, our application to wine, what we're trying to do is try to understand how different wine flavors produce these reactions in the body of consumers. And uh, we are using these measures as a direct sensory response opposite to the traditional method that we have been using for a long time, which is ratings. Uh, actually, this type of measurement is, uh, uh, do not require any participant to think about or to make a reflection about what they just experienced seconds ago. It, it is recorded on time or live, and uh, therefore we believe that it can help us to better understand consumer experience. And consumer experience nowadays, uh, it's a very dynamic uh, field of research. And uh, we believe that trying to pin down which odorants or flavors in wine can uh, produce reactions in, in participants can give us a better assessment of what wine quality is. Um, one of the, I wanted to show you as well, well, we have uh, current questions that we're addressing before we jump into that. Uh, current questions that we're addressing with the, the thesis of uh, both Corey and Robert is uh, which odorants are able to evoke these biopotentials, which uh, odorants are, or flavors are able to, to arouse uh, consumers, which signals are reproducible, uh, of course, what, uh, what Robert showed you, it was raw data from one participant, which was uh, himself, but uh, across different participants uh, is, are the signals a good source of information. Um, another question that we are asking is, what is the effect of having different concentrations, which of course happens in wine, and not only in wine, but in grapes and, and pretty much any food. Um, we are also addressing the questions of uh, what is the influence of expertise 
we, if we compare these biopotentials from consumers versus experts, are any changes uh, in body reactions associated with this condition? Now, um, I wanted to show you as well, the, give you a lab demo of the um, how it looks the live recording. So what we have here um, is uh, the software that we use to record the biopotentials. And uh, if I click start, Actually, you see all these wires around me because uh, I am recording my body reactions right now. And uh, what you can see, as Robert mentioned before, in the top channel, this uh, uh, number one, it might be very small in your screens, but the top channel, the red channel, is my frown. And uh, if you see, if I do small frowns, you will start be, uh, you will start to see these responses and how they, they get recorded. So if I smile a lot, you can see my smile in there. And then when I stop, even if I do small, very brief um, uh, response, I can, I can see that in the, in the, with the software. Now what you see here is my heartbeat. If I select a period uh, of time over here, I, I have some online uh, measurements here showing a, a heartbeat of 108, which of course indicate that I am under stress because I am presenting to how many, uh, we had almost, uh, almost 100 participants, so uh, it's, uh, it's normal. To, to have this. So on the bottom part, we have the EDA, which is this, uh, this, uh, uh, this electrodes that are recording how much sweat on my hands I have or changes associated with the, the, um, the amount of sweat on my hands, which changes the electrical conductivity here. So, one of the tests that we do to participants to make sure that this signal is uh, uh, working is that we clap unexpectedly to, to see, and usually after a, a big clap by your ears, um, we typically see this rise that you are actually, now it went out of, of chart, let's bring it back. And this is a typical reaction and an example of how we are constantly reacting to our environment. Um, so, and uh, these, uh, these electrodes are all wireless, I'm, uh, which uh, allows me to eventually um, grab a glass of wine and be walking around. We're hoping to do a little bit more immersive experiments where we have uh, uh, real wines and people interacting in a typical wine tasting environment. I also wanted to take the opportunity to take you over the lab. And uh, show you the facilities. So what you see here on this part is the equipment that we use to record. This is the receiver of the transducers and this is sending the uh, information to the screen that you just saw. On this side, this is a screen that is usually inside of the sensory boots on the other side, uh, which uh, will uh, conduct the sensory trial and it allows us to send instructions to participants. The sensory lab has also, let me show you around, whoops, has seven boots to perform uh, sensory experiments with seven participants at the same time. We have a preparation area equipped with fridges, uh, glasses, uh, washing stations, and there's uh, fridges uh, as well. And, uh, this allows us to prepare everything um, for 
different uh, types of sensor experiments, not only wine, but also fruit, uh, for example, grapes. And of course, we usually share the space with other, with other researchers in the, in the center. So if you, uh, from our side, this is, uh, this is it. And we'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Miguel. That was a really interesting uh, presentation, and I, I really like the um, the live event that makes it makes it much more approachable. Um, we actually have a question for you. Um, what were the concentrations of each of the aromas uh, Robert was exposed to? Were they at recognition threshold or just detection threshold? Those aromas were five times above the, the threshold. For um, for those specific molecules, and uh, it's a it's a very good uh, question because we're what we're trying uh, on the first part of our uh, research uh, experiments. What we have been trying to do is to identify which odorants can give us more information, and then uh, Robert. Uh, Robert's thesis is uh, addressing the question of the concentration. So we're testing below and above threshold. And when I'm when I, when I speak of thresholds, is uh, wine thresholds. And then Corey is uh, Corey's uh, thesis is uh, trying to answer the question of what happens when we spike wines with that with those odorants within a typical range of, uh, of wine. So uh, she will be working with, uh, with white wines. And uh, so we will try to, to, to pin down those, uh, those questions with their, with their thesis. Don't think that we have any more questions from the audience. I actually have a question. Um, I, you were starting with uh, a certain group of aroma compounds. I think you, you started with green aroma compounds. Is there, uh, is there a reason for that? And are you planning to expand that to, to other areas of aroma as well? Yes, uh, the, the, the first experiment that we did, we, had, we tried to have two positive and two negative uh, odorants. Uh, on, our, on a second experiment, we really expanded uh, to only wine aromas, uh, spanning odorant series. So we had some wood, uh, wood odorants, we had some uh, primary or grape aromas, both positive and negative. Uh, and then uh, we, have, uh, we had some defects. We included, for example, TCA. Uh, we included uh, for ethyl phenyl. And uh, as I was showing you as well in the, in, the in, in last slide, there's been around 9,000 uh, flavored compounds, not only uh, odorants, but other flavored compounds in wine. And so the task that we're after to try to identify which are actually able to evoke these, uh, these reactions it's it's huge. We are uh, we are after a huge uh, endeavor, which uh, of course is not only being tackled by my lab, but other labs uh, uh, are already starting to do that, uh, specifically mostly in Europe right now. But um, but yeah, we are we are uh, hoping to address the questions as well of mouthfeel. Uh, we're trying to uh, we'll be trying to to grow a project on, uh, on manoproteins and uh, how changes in those concentrations or the effect of those, uh, of those additives can evoke or change our, our physiology. We are trying to understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another question for you. Um, how might your sensor data correlate with wine scores? That's, a, that's an excellent question. And that's why part of the, uh, as Robert was showing you, the, there is always a moment when we record the scores. And then we are trying to establish those correlations 
between the, for example, the for each of the signals, uh, we are trying to find if one of the signals has a correlation with uh, with the wine scores. It's uh, and of course, this is only a few uh, biometrics or biopotentials that we can record. There's others, there's temperature, and but we we are uh, hoping that this uh, these three can inform us and uh, how much a correlation there is. Again, one of the problems with uh, with this course is the choice of the scale. For example, the scaling methods have been. Uh, course used uh, extensively in uh, sensor research because there, it's, it's data that is somehow easy to collect but if you ask uh, for example liking and you change the scale from like dislike to a scale from one to five or minus four to plus four it all uh, it really depends on the participant who is using the scale and how that um, wine is being scored. So we, and going back to your, uh, to your, to your questions, we are trying to do a uh, correlation analysis to see if one of the signals uh, relates directly to those, uh, to those ratings. But again, this is more like a complementary measurement of those ratings. There's uh, it's not a rule that we will find that exact uh, correlation for all of the signals. Mm -hmm. um, I have more questions for you. Um, and this is a, a three-part question. So the, the first part is, um, are you using off-the-shelf sensors and software? And the second part is, were any components newly developed? And the third part, do you envision commercialization uh, oh, commercializing this biopotential evaluation system. I am not sure that I understand the the all the shelf uh, uh, sensors. Is that the wireless part? So um, this uh, these sensors are again wireless, as you can see. I'm walking by, and all these uh, things are the transmitters. Uh, these uh, sensors are actually produced by a California company called Biopack. And uh, again, the idea behind this, uh, these sensors is to allow us to study wine evaluation in more immersive environments. So we can take this equipment to a bar or uh, a winery um, a selling point where we can see, or a tasting room, I'm sorry, to, to see how participants uh, produce these biopotentials in a live environment. Uh, the software comes with uh, the, when you purchase the, the equipment, the software comes with. One of the things, uh, important things that I will actually, I missed it, my very last slide, so I will, I as well to say thank you to our collaborators. And uh, what you see here, it's, uh, this is a collaborative project between uh, the food science uh, department, uh, Dr. Cameron Con, uh, Dr. Martin Shapiro from the Department of Psychology and Dr. Hubert Chicali from the Department of Computer Science. So most of the data analysis has been as well as streamlined by uh, Dr. Chicotti and Dr. Shapiro, so that once we collect the data, uh, they have uh, scripts that automatize the, the data analysis and actually create actual figures um, right after we finish with one participant. So um, again, the software is kind of a mixture. You have, there's analysis software with equipment, but uh, you can also develop scripts to uh, make analysis easier. Uh, and the final question, do I ambition to commercialize this uh, system? We are hoping to, to bring this tool to, to wineries and actually we're collaborating right now with Treasury Wine States. They have been uh, supporting our, us from the, from the beginning. And uh, we're hoping that uh, eventually we can, once uh, we find 
which tolerance are evoking these biopotentials reliably uh, that uh, this system is available for, for wineries to use or uh, other uh, sensory companies dealing with, uh, with consumer experience. Uh, I must say as well that uh, besides uh, the support from Treasury Wine States, I want to thank uh, ARI, the Agricultural Research Institute of uh, the CSU, uh, the Industry Advisory Board of the Department of Viticulture and Technology for supporting our project uh, from day one. And I uh, also want to thank uh, past undergraduate students that have been working in, in our lab and helping to develop the, the techniques that you just saw today. Okay, thank you very much. Um, seems like we don't have any more questions, which is probably good because we only have five minutes left. So I think it, um, it is time for, um, for closing remarks. And um, I would like to thank all the speakers for, um, for their contribution. It was really um, a nice mix of, of topics. I'd like to um, thank our, our sponsor, American Vineyard Magazine, for, for supporting us and the, the Fresno State Alumni Association for marketing and technical support of the event. Um, if any of you comes up with any more questions, the email addresses for, um, for all our presenters are in the program. You can email um, our presenters with your questions. If you're interested in um, learning about the program and learning about um, the events in the future, there's a, an email list that you can sign up to. You can follow us on Facebook and other social media. Um, there's always news about the program, about our students and their involvement in, in research. And if you have any, any real life problems, any questions that you need answered, um, please contact us. We're happy to, uh, to support any industry need um, that might be out there. If you, if you need resources, again, our website is, is probably a good place to start. There's also the Vincent E. Petrucci Library um, in, um, in Viticulture and Enology um, that you can use. It's uh, open to the public. It's open for, for industry. So you can always come in and, and check out resources. Um, for, for anything uh, related to the academic program, uh, again, the website is, is probably um, the best place to start. If you have any, any questions about uh, this event, any uh, future events, please, please email us. Today's program has been recorded um, and the recording will be available through a link on our website uh, with in approximately one week. And um, at this point, I can uh, leave you with a few um, final slides that will uh, give you more information and show you uh, a few links that you might be able to use in, um, in the next uh, few days and few weeks until this video uh, is online. Thank you all very much for your uh, participation and your interest. And um, I hope to see you all uh, either in a virtual event sometime soon or an in-person event in the not too distant future. <laughs>